so let's begin hello everyone um, we are waiting for hillary but he will join us let's begin um, good morning good afternoon and good evening depending upon which part of the world you're joining us from uh, we hope you have been doing well through the corona crisis that is unfolding around us we hope that you have managed to stay healthy stay productive and stay sane through this new reality that has descended upon us without much of a warning actually we wish you all the luck and all the strength that you need to power through this we we thought we as meta meta and as the water channel thought that a productive use of this downtime was to reflect upon the work that we do and to share what we have learned and uh, that's the reason okay um, is my voice okay some people are having problems uh, hearing me but uh, in the background we are trying to fix that um we thought that we use this time this downtime to reflect upon what we do and to share insights the learnings from our work and that's the reason we have been organizing a webinar a week we will continue to do so for the coming few weeks the webinar today is about a few basic things in life roads or transport which uh, we need to go from a to b and water which we need for pretty much everything we do but most importantly it is about how these two things are related to each other how road management affects water management on one hand and how water management affects road management on the other roads often cause erosion and floods they impact the movement of sand dune in desert areas which is very important um and at the same time water flow is a lead cause of road damage uh damaged and that's true for both paved and unpaved roads so these are some of the threats and through proper planning design and construction of roads some of these threats can be turned on their heads and converted into opportunities for example the rain that falls on the roads can be harvested and diverted strategically towards agricultural fields or towards groundwater recharge to wells uh, this can be done and uh, this is done using using diversion structures and canals and doing this also decreases the amount of damage that rains do to the roads so it goes both ways this is just uh, one super basic example there are several such measures that can be taken to do good uh, road water management as it were to suit different kinds of roads and different kinds of landscapes and in different kinds of hydrological situations we as uh, the water channel and as meta meta have been striving towards implementing these solutions and the overall approach of road water management in 10 countries uh in asia africa and south america and uh, this has been done in partnership with different organizations and together we form the roads for water learning alliance i think since the time i used this uh, set of logos of this slide uh, the list has increased um uh, uh, since then so we will update it um we are fortunate to have with us today some colleagues from meta meta first of all we have from van steinbergen who was instrumental in the birthing of the roads uh, of the roads for water approach a few years ago frank will explain the approach and talk about how it has evolved to something which we now call the green roads for water approach we also have with us saroj yakami from meta meta nepal and hilary uh, hilary galiwango from meta meta uganda who have been leading the efforts to implement the roads for water approach in uh, nepal and uganda uh before we hand over the proceedings to the speakers uh, some housekeeping we'll have about 30 minutes of presentation followed by a q and a session we encourage you to keep sharing your questions and comments throughout the webinar through the chat box here um and uh, we will bring them to the attention of the speakers during the q and a session so we will begin with uh, from uh frank i'll pull up your presentation in a moment on the screen please take it away uh i'm still waiting abraham for the presentation to load frank are you there um, yeah yeah I'm there. Yes. Frank, are you there? Are you okay. Okay. Good. 
Could, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I can move to another place uh, if uh, the connection uh, is not uh, too good. Um, anyhow, let me start. And uh, first of all, I'm really delighted to, uh, to see the attendance and uh, see the different names that are uh, uh, taking part. And uh, there's some new names and there's some uh, old and names and sort of trusted allies in uh, promoting the program on, uh, on Green Roads for Water. Uh, what I would like to do is to take you a little bit through the opportunities and through the program we're having and at the end reflect a little bit on the uh, current situation um, with the uh, uh, corona crisis and, 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 and probably other sort of big challenges we still uh, have in our hands and uh, we should uh, uh, deal with. Can I first ask is uh, I see some people said they don't hear me very well. I hope it's being uh, taken care of. Yeah. It's another one. Okay. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let me, I, I will move myself to another location. Yeah. And maybe that will improve. Okay, good. Uh, well, first of all, um, I would like to take you through the the, the opportunities in, in promoting roads for water, yeah, and um, uh, basically, like Abraham said, yeah, uh, we can look at roads as means of uh, transport, taking people from place A to B, yeah, but roads can be a lot more. They can be uh, instruments for improved livelihoods, yeah, yeah. They can be uh, uh, also uh, instruments for water management, for climate resilience, yeah. And for uh, okay, yeah, uh, for climate resilience and also uh, for recovery, yeah. No, I'm not muted. Uh, Frank, please go ahead with your presentations uh, because we have about 48 users. Uh, the servers of Adobe Connect, this platform that we are using for the webinar, it's also very busy. I spoke to them yesterday and they said that uh, they are expecting some problems because uh, they are facing a large number of webinars happening at the same time. Uh, so uh, it will be a problem with some people in the background. We'll keep trying to optimize this as best as we can. But uh, uh, I think uh, there is no problem with your connection. So please just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, well, um, I, will, I will talk as loud as possible, <laughs> so I'll put up my own volume as well, yeah? So it's unfortunate we, we have to keep social distance, otherwise you might even hear me uh, 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 shouting out, you see? Um, anyhow, we think roads, we, we, we discovered roads can do a lot more than just uh, being means of transport. Roads are have a major uh, impact on the uh, hydrology of entire areas. Yeah? Basically, you know, they block and they guide water, they concentrate runoff, yeah, particularly in slopey areas. When there's a natural slope, the water runs off the entire slope. When you have a road, it's concentrated in a few places. They interfere, yeah, with subsurface flows, they change flooding patterns, and also, and that's very important, roads get damaged in the process, yeah. Um, so what is uh, uh, happening is at the moment often this relation is negative yeah uh, roads are a major cause of erosion yeah because they concentrate the flows they take into to drainage uh, uh, channels that didn't uh, uh, exist uh, they uh, cause local flooding yeah because they blow block the Sorry, everyone, we seem to have lost Frank, uh, and I see that he's back, so. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. Yeah, okay, so roads are uh, a major uh, source, yeah, 
of uh, uh, they, they have a major impact on the uh, surface hydrology and even of the sur subsurface hydrology. Roads also, particularly unpaved roads, are a major cause of dust and that creates health problems and crop losses. So at the moment, this relationship is negative. You talk with road people, yeah, they say, yes, um, you know, the number one enemy of roads is water, the number two enemy of roads is water, and the number three enemy of roads is is water as well. So if we can turn this around, yeah, then I think we can have a, a major impact, yeah. And roads and water sort of support one another because uh, roads, you know, because they are almost everywhere, uh, they are a sort of major intervention in landscapes. They can be used to harvest water, they can uh, be helped to reduce floods, they can retain floods, they can guide runoff to uh, recharge areas, to serve storages, and to many places. Yeah? So this is the idea of the green roads for water uh, and the green roads for water movement. Yeah? So what are green roads for water? Of course, yeah? the last point is very uh, important. Yeah? Um, roads that connect rural communities yeah, to food service and markets. I mean, of course, this is always the first function of a road. Yeah? But also, roads can increase the climate resilience of communities. They can be used for beneficial water management. They can help reduce land degradation, even turn it around. Yeah? They, can even, they can improve the water supply to rural communities. Uh, roads can be used for flood protection. And roads can use a lot of uh, employment opportunities. And the impact of turning normal roads into green roads for water is uh, uh, tremendous. I think these days it's very interesting. We hear a lot of big numbers, you know. What will be the damage to our economy because of the uh, corona uh, 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 crisis and, and, the, uh, um, and the lockdowns? Yeah? And often we hear the figures of uh, a trillion, half a trillion. But it's also good to, to get a bit of a feeling of these big numbers. Uh, the major invest the, the investment in roads globally, yeah, according to different estimates, yeah. Uh, is one to two trillion US dollars a year. So that's an enormous amount. That is a sort of amount that we also hear, yeah, if people talk about the damage, for instance, to the US economy because of the corona crisis. So this is, this is a major uh, opportunity, yeah. Um, and uh, in, in Asia, for instance, uh, you know, and, and all globally, it's, it's the, the, the estimate of the number of kilometers of roads that is added. It runs into millions. So if all those roads can have an element of water management, I think we can do a, a great job in securing water. Yeah? And there's also a benefit on the road side. I already mentioned that roads cause 35 to 80 yeah, percent of damage uh, to the roads. The 80 percent is particularly for the rural roads, for the roads that connect the most vulnerable communities, the, uh, the unpaved uh, feeder roads. The 35 percent is more for the highways. Yeah? We've done work in different countries, you will hear Hillary, yeah, you will hear Saroj. Um, and, you know, if you walk along 10 kilometers of road, you will see between 8 to 25 flash bombs. Something is happening there. You know, erosion, some flooding, yeah, a missed opportunity to harvest water. At the same time, also, in the fa last five years, uh, since we started to work uh, on the uh, Green Roads for Water uh, programs, there's many tested uh, uh, measures that we've come across. Some were already existing, were not scaled up, yeah. And many of these measures are quite low cost, yeah. Um, and usually the rate of return is quite high. Uh, I'll give you some figures later, but uh, it can be up to four to a factor four or five per year. I just want to take you through some of these measures so you get a feeling of what is happening. Yeah? Um, here, for instance, uh, you see uh, examples from uh, Kenya and also from uh, uh, Mozambique. Yeah? Um, on the uh, upper left, you see a, a, a road crossing. That road crossing can also act as a sand dam. It can retain the sediment that comes with the floods uh, you know, upstream of the road crossing. And if it's done properly, yeah, uh, you can build up like a mini aquifer in a, in a sandy river. And roads can also feed uh, the um, moisture in the land. If you take water from a culvert, that's the lower picture, it will provide water to the root zone of the, uh, of the, the 
plan. So you 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 can use the uh, culverts in that way. We can do a lot of roadside tree planting, which is very important for dust control and is a sort of valuable asset in itself. Yeah? Um, we can also uh, use the road. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, right picture. Yeah, to create a storage. Yeah, the road body. Yeah, is usually often elevated, and if in in different areas you can use that elevation by. Um, uh, and you can use it to uh, to store water yeah? and during high rainfall and then release it slowly for productive use. You see this picture comes from Mali, where you also see the uh, slots for the stop locks so that they can close it and open it. And basically, you've created a reservoir with very small cost. We can also use borrow pits. That's the picture from Mozambique on the lower uh, uh, right side where they even lined an old borrow pit to make sure the water wouldn't seep away. And uh, the excavation didn't need to be done. And so a, a good storage of, uh, of water in a very dry area was created. Um, just a few things. I want to explain each and everything. Yeah? Um, but uh, I like, for instance, the picture. And it's very much also the presentation of, uh, of Hillary, the, the, present, the, the picture on the uh, uh, right uh, site on the upper picture. There, uh, often if you make roads through mountain areas, you open up springs, and um, we really need to protect such springs and use them beneficially for for drinking water. Yeah? Um, another picture uh, on the uh, next to it on the upper left side uh, is again a culvert, yeah? and just taking that flood water to an area and growing fodder from it from local grasses. It's a very easy thing to do. Uh, the last set of pictures relates to uh, you know, controlling water with roads. This is more from Bangladesh. The other pictures were from arid and semi-arid areas. Uh, in Bangladesh, it's very interesting. Yeah? In the coastal areas, new uh, rice varieties are introduced, which have much higher yield and a shorter duration. But they need some water management. You need to sometimes drain the field and sometimes retain the water. So the main infrastructure which is there to do this, and you can see that from the two pictures on the left side and also the lower picture on the right side, are the roads. The roads are already there in these flat pictures, only we need to use them systematically for water management so that we retain water when we want it. And for instance, with a gated culvert, yeah, uh, we can... Uh, 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 we can we can release the water and we can drain the rice field and then apply some fertilizer if needed and then close it again. So this program was introduced a few years ago in Bangladesh and uh, it, it has been followed uh, on a large way. The last picture again from a sort of area, a low-lying coastal area, which is very important, is that uh, roads also uh, serve as major evacuation routes and sometimes also as flood channels. Uh, shelters. And I think this is, again, an area where a lot more can be done and a lot more is being done in several countries now uh, to make sure our roads lead to the flood shelters. We don't only build the flood shelters, but we also may lead, build the roads leading to it. But also very importantly, in low-lying areas to build roads which are a bit higher because uh, they will act as a flood shelter. And what is the experience in Bangladesh is that a lot of people who drowned, drowned because they were trying to take their livestock to a safe place. And you cannot all take them to a flood shelter, but you can take them on a higher uh, section of the road. Good, so there's a lot of experience. And uh, I'm really happy to say that we have uh, brought together all this experience. And this is not the learning from Meta Meta at all only. I mean, this is really uh, the sort of collective wisdom from so many people in so many countries that we sort of we're lucky enough to sort of capture and document. And uh, guidelines are ready. Um, I think you see people typing their name. And you would really be happy to share uh, these guidelines. They are about to be published by the World Bank. And they explain the sort of approach, uh, the opportunities in different geographies. I'll give you some examples there. The different techniques, also the governance, the economics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, uh, we also hope this is a sort of live uh, document, a live exercise, because new experience keep uh, appearing 
and there's a lot of creativity uh, all over the world and um, that we should keep capturing. If we look at semi-arid areas, of course, there are the roads. Yeah? They can control erosion. Yeah, They can capture the floods. There's different ways of doing it. We saw some examples, the infiltration trenches uh, that can be used. Uh, they can be uh, used to uh, divert water. Um, they can be used as a sand dam. Yeah? If you go to coastal areas, we saw the examples from, uh, from Bangladesh. Yeah? Uh, roads can be used to, to retain water in these low-lying areas. They can be used as evacuation uh, uh, road, routes as well. Yeah? If you go to mountain areas, uh, we have a, 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 often a real uh, challenge to stabilize the mountain areas. And again, roads can play a major role. But also, it's very important, we found in mountain areas, to integrate road development with the whole protection of the mountain areas, so and also that roads are safe. Uh, and then, for instance, some sort of spring capture very much for the mountain areas. Um, also very important uh, is roads for rural water supply. Um, uh, of course, uh, systematically recharge groundwater at the right places. Huh? using the road body. And this is something I want to emphasize. You don't use the road surface, yeah? but you use the road body yeah? to, 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 to capture water, to guide water. Yeah? And we can also, sometimes when there's no other way, particularly for livestock, we can use the uh, ponds that are created along the roads for the building material. And then we can also can capture the springs. Yeah? What is really important is also that this is a sort of a new thing, and, and we need to have much more interaction between road uh, builders, water builders, uh, land use planners, etc., etc. Now, I think often all these are uh, communities that do their own thing in the best way possible, but they would benefit a lot by integrating with others. We also find yeah, that being sincere and having high integrity is really important in such Measures don't take the sort of short-term uh, view, but take a long-term sustainable view. And what is also important, what we found in doing all this program, is the engagement with roadside communities. Every area has its own solution, yeah. And in dialogue with the local users, you you find these best solutions and also the acceptance of them. This is a big table. I don't want to show it in too much detail, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, it's all in the guidelines, but, but I want to highlight one, one, one way of thinking. We talk a lot about resilience, yeah? and road people in the road community often talk about resilience, and what they do is they say, uh, we should make the road very resilient for climate change. Yeah? So there will be more rainfall, there will be higher flood peaks, so the road should be able to stand up to that. We say, okay, that's a sort of basic, very protective concept of resilience. We protect the road. Yeah? But what you do yeah, in such situations, you can protect the road, you can make a bigger culvert so that it can pass through a larger flood. So what will happen, it will create more havoc on the area around it and you will not make use of the opportunities uh, to, uh, uh, to use the road in a, in, a, in a positive way to contribute it to uh, resilience. So we said there's two other levels of resilience. Yeah? We call it resilience plus. One is adaptive and one is proactive. Adaptive is that we say we have the road. Yeah? The road has already been built, but let's now make better use of the road as it is. Let's take water from the culverts to recharge areas. Yeah? Um, let's uh, uh, convert, uh, like in Bangladesh, the culverts and uh, make them gated structures so you can manage water for the, uh, uh, the, the cultivation around it. Yeah? So that's adaptive. Proactive is the next level. Yeah? We redesign the road infrastructure, keeping in mind that roads have more than one function. It doesn't only have the transport function, it also has the resilience and water management uh, function. So there are different, uh, different ways of looking at resilience, but we think this this more integrated, adaptive, and proactive concept of resilience is much better because the simple way of protecting the roads against higher rainfall and you know different climates actually could be good for the road, but bad for the, everything around the road. Yeah? Um, 
Here I want to show uh, the long-term monitoring that we've done uh, in Tigray in Ethiopia. And I should say that that's where the program started. And maybe it's good to, to, uh, to, 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 to give the anecdote. We had a, a research program on looking at the link between roads and groundwater recharge. And we showed it to the people uh, in responsible for the watershed uh, campaigns, and they immediately picked it up. So we didn't need to do the research to convince them. Anyhow, over the last uh, six, seven years, we have been measuring the, uh, the groundwater levels, the soil moisture, and uh, uh, you can see that the institute moisture contribution has all been increased and it's much more secure. The groundwater tables have also uh, increased from, you know, in those 10 locations, the shallow groundwater tables, but they were like minus eight, minus seven meters, and now they're minus three, minus four meters. Yeah? Good. Um, the other good news is that, um, in general, the, the additional costs are quite low and the returns are high. Yeah? We did work, we worked out in Ethiopia these measures, and then if you do all the sort of uh, adaptive measures, not the proactive measures, uh, uh, including the capacity building, by the way, around 10 kilometers of road, you would spend like between three to 4,000 US dollars. But the benefits in terms of reduced maintenance, reduced land damage, benefits for agriculture are effective for. So within a year, yeah, you can earn it back four times. And, you know, when we first found this, it sounded like, you know, this song of, of uh, Frankie Vialli, uh, too good to be true. And, but we had it independently verified by two different organizations, and they said, actually, it's going to be higher even on this. Similarly, in Bangladesh, yeah, now uh, often roads are built, not taking into account the uh, situation in the low-lying polder areas. And so you get a lot of water logging uh, and a lot of loss of, of production. But if you would improve the water logging and have better water level control, we calculated for two polders that an investment of 200,000 would give you probably a return in increased rice production of more than $3 million. Again, uh, we worked at the benefits of roadside tree planting. Again, the benefits are really factors like factor four to factor 10 to 50. And usually you, 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 you can do a lot of measures which are not very costly. I think Hillary will guide us through the work he has been doing on that. So we have this ambition to introduce this program uh, in you know, half of the countries of Africa and Asia in, uh, by 2025. And we're working together with the World Bank, with ADB, with DRP, with the International Roads Federation. We're also in discussion with the World Food Program yeah, to sort of push these techniques, push this approach much wider. Um, I see a lot of people ask for uh, material. Yeah? And for sure, we have a lot of material on the website, but if we have your mailing list, um, we're really happy to, to share much more. Um, we're doing this together with different players, with national road building programs, with financing institutes, with universities, yeah? with bilateral, multilateral organizations, the private sector foundations, with big NGOs, small NGOs. And um, what we try to do is to make this also an area of finance, yeah? not an area of only piloting, make it a mainstream activity. In Ethiopia, uh, I think that's still, and that's by far the, the largest implementation, they've made it part of their annual uh, watershed campaigns. And so they, they mobilize uh, really two, three millions of people yeah, in the different uh, regions to do all those measures alongside with all the watershed uh, activities. And I think these things, this, this is almost a no-brainer and can be done at scale. We're also building up a community of practice that's we're really happy and we have this webinar with the good attendance and a lot of new names as well. We have promotional material, uh, guided learning material, uh, which is really for everybody to use. And also we try to work on the ground with different programs. Again, you will hear some examples later. Um, we, we live in a time of Corona. We live in a time of, uh, like Evan said, new realities. Yeah? Um, and I think 
what I see, we now have old realities and new realities, uh, you know, you know, adding to one another, yeah? because um, we still have droughts, yeah? we still have the locust uh, uh, threat in 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 large parts of the world. Yeah? So we still keep having emergencies. They do not go away. Yeah? Of course, we are um, very much worried and upset and prepared uh, with the COVID-19, but these existing emergencies are there as well. I mean, for instance, uh, there are predictions in South Africa at the moment that um, there were really dry, it was really a dry year in the, in the last one or two years. And um, the cereal production is below average, so food security is uh, increasing, life con so conditions are also poor, yeah? and we have an increase in the number of food insecure people. Yeah? So on top of this, we have the COVID-19, yeah? and I think we all try to understand what it's doing with ourselves, and, you know, and every day I think we, 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 we have new learnings. But um, this morning, of course, like, uh, this morning, uh, we were in touch with people in Pakistan in, in the remote uh, spate dependent areas and they've done some assessment what was happening. Of course, we have the increased morbidity and mortality, which is a uh, huge risk, but also the quarantining, which means that there's at the moment no movement of daily farm labor. Yeah? So those people lost their income. Yeah? Uh, it also invests the harvested quantities, particularly of perishable crops at the moment. Yeah? But also, for instance, what they're saying is, there's less weeding, so there's much more wheat seeds mixed with grains, and so the grain quality is less than, than other years. And then we have slowed down operation of agribusiness and agriculture frontline workers, uh, like extension agents. Yeah? So I think roads also, you know, in this sort of recovery, yeah? in this sort of uh, you know, rebuilding that we're going to have, are, are essential roads are always vital to reach highly effective areas. And, um, and this uh, will be uh, uh, even more. Yeah? Secondly, also, uh, if we can use roads to create more water security in a major way, and this is we've seen in Ethiopia with the monitoring and the scale that's being done there, yeah? uh, we also have a major contribution to make to public health. And the third thing where I think really we need to, to think of is that I would expect yeah, that in the hardest hit areas where you have, already have an emergency and on top of it you have the COVID-19 and the quarantines, we will have to have safety net programs, uh, you know, uh, cash for work or food for work programs. Yeah? Uh, and often this revolves around, you know, building community routes, repairing community routes. And I think we should now build them back better, yeah? make use of this, uh, you know, this serious uh, period and come back to, uh, to a system which is better where the uh, water harvesting and the water retention, the water management facilities are systematically built into the labor programs. And I mean, these are examples, this is, uh, you know, the type of simple measures uh, in uh, labor programs that, that can be introduced. Um, some people ask for resources. There's a lot of resources we, we have there. And uh, like I say, we, we really feel delighted if it's shared uh, a lot. And um, I want to end with this. Uh, uh, I apologize for doing this presentation. Thanks a lot, Fran. Um, uh, Saroj, can we move on to you next? We will take questions during the Q&A session. So that would be after presentations from Saroj and uh, Hillary. And uh, in a moment, we will have Saroj's slides on the screen. Thank you, Avram. I'm just waiting for the pres presentation to come on my screen. Okay, uh, it is here now. Uh, uh, thank you, Frank, for presenting it more detail. It makes our life more easier to present the country part. So uh, <clears throat> here in, in our case, I'll be presenting some cases, uh, issues from uh, Nepal, Green Roads for Water in Nepal cases. 
So, <coughs> if you see in the pictures, uh, we do take this picture I mean, uh, from the Karnali region of Nepal, where you can see a road and certainly a debris is flowing down towards the river over here, river areas and blocking the uh, river courses. Definitely. So basically, uh, if I have to say about something about Nepal, uh, it is it lies in South Asia and geographically Nepal has a tree uh, divided into three parts. Um, I hope everyone can hear it well. And of which uh, hill and mountain uh, covers around more than 75 percent, and the rest is the uh, terrain. So, <clears throat> so I I, I try I'm trying to say something of opportunities of green roof water in Nepal and, and try to segregate it for hill and mountain and then Tarai. The first on the uh, right side, uh, right top corner, you will see a, a, a spring. <coughs> it comes up out of the uh, the cut part of the roadside. And this this is a fit. I mean, this happens when most of the hill and um, mountain area when we uh, construct a road. Uh, road uh, springs and it seeps souls up. And actually, uh, in hill and a mountain area, the spring source are the main source of water. Either it's for drinking water or it's for the agriculture. <coughs> so, and then you can see it, when, and like in the pictures, you see the, the springs come out and then just flow across the road and then. Uh, the, the, the issue is that uh, it creates a problem in the surface as well as form a depression during, and then it will get more worse during the uh, rainy seasons. So <clears throat> we think that uh, this is an opportunity uh, when we are uh, making a road, integrating uh, spring and sip management would be uh, one good opportunity for hill and mountain areas. Similarly, <clears throat> uh, other opportunities is water harvesting from the roads. Uh, this this photograph I've taken from uh, the Mugu district of Nepal, that is in Karnal region mountain area, where uh, DFID had been uh, constructing a road, and then sorry, and road and and there are a number of uh, ponds uh, we saw there uh, during our field trip, where farmer collect water either from the roads or the spring uh, to the ponds and then uh, use them for the cortical pur purposes. I mean, uh, definitely those areas have a low uh, rainfall, uh, but uh, these are uh, sufficient for a few of the horticulture practices in the areas. Another opportunity is, is uh, like uh, we could do a slope protection and then water retention using spoils. Because during the road construction in hilly area, we use a cut, cut method, cut method where you have a lot of spoils coming out when you cut the uh, <coughs> slope areas. And then those poles can be used to uh, to construct. I mean, if if you can see the left top corner, you can see some kind of uh, measures to undertake a uh, uh, slope protection measures like a semicircular uh, uh, and, and eyebrows where you put them in facing upward in the slope direction. And then those poles can retain the water and reduce the flow of the water to the downstream, reducing the erosion and landslide. And then uh, other one is like uh, there is an issue of this uh, uh, sediments uh, where the road crosses the farmlands. So <clears throat> we can use of these infiltration burns where I mean we can use those uh, locally available metal like stones. I mean those are available when we started cutting this uh, upstream parts. So we put it in zigzag form and then these, these structures actually trap this. Uh, uh, the sediments from the road and then only water flow into the farmlands. Now let's move to the uh, some opportunities in uh, uh, green roof water in the Tarai context. So we can do some kind of flood management. We, we see a lot of issues about the flood in the in, in, in the Tarai part of Nepal. So there are a lot of programs where uh, river uh, courses are making wider and there is embankment is constructing, but there is an issue with the <coughs> breezes where breeze function as a choking uh, function as choking part of the uh, the river where they choke and then 
uh, the water just flow on top of those uh, embankments uh, which should actually protect the water from going outside so <clears throat> this thing i mean you can see a pictures from uh, a mohotari district we took it where uh, the rare, uh, where the uh, water actually uh, got the embankment Sorry, everyone. Uh, we seem to have lost uh, Saroj. Um, we are trying to uh, to get him back uh, on in the background. Um, uh, yeah, please be patient, and uh, yeah, this should take just a minute or so. Uh, maybe you can see me now because uh, there was some issue with the internet. Yes, yeah, Saroj, you need to click on start sharing. Like on top of your image, uh, it's written start sharing. And if you click on that text, then you would be able to hear you. Hilary, are you with us still? Yeah, Frank, we are trying to get Saroj back on. Back on. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm you. One second, I will just mute Hilary. Uh, in, in, in the meantime, perhaps uh, we could talk about uh, uh, this question that has come up regarding uh, environmental impact assessment. Uh, with regards to road water harvesting uh, techniques or approach when implemented on a large scale or in highland areas. Uh, is environmental impact assessment recommended? Uh, are there various techniques suitable for the areas receiving high rainfall? Uh, is this something that has come up in our work so far in uh, hilly areas? Yeah, um, Ibrahim, maybe I can uh, take that uh, question because I was with Saroj uh, doing the work also in the mountain areas and then also we worked in uh, Tajikistan. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's a good practice uh, uh, everywhere to do an environmental impact assessment uh, for large interventions. And uh, I think in mountain areas, we need to be careful. You can see it from the roads which are being built uh, already that sometimes road creates uh, they trigger landslides or they uh, you know they create flooding in areas which are very sensitive um, um, so I think for all the road programs uh, this is uh, this is required um, what I've seen in Nepal and also in Tajikistan is that uh, doing it right um, can uh, make a big difference. Uh, for instance, what is now a practice which is emerging more and more in Nepal is that uh, a lot of road building is going on, roads are just being opened up, basic things are not being sort of observed, like the slope, you know, like the location of the road. So these roads develop into uh, big, uh, big drains. And I've also seen in Ethiopia sometimes, you know, if you have a mountain, there is no drainage pattern developed. Now you take a road to the top of the mountain, you create a river basically. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do that a lot better. In Nepal, they had a very uh, long history. And I also see a lot of friends from WWF who have a lot to, to share on that uh, as well, on, uh, on doing proper road construction. So, you know, observing the proper slopes, uh, protecting the hillsides, using the spoils to, uh, to do good things and not destroying the uh, environment uh, around the roads. Very important bioengineering, yeah? using of natural plants, 
you know, that grow in these habitats, but to sort of plant them along the roads to stabilize the soils. And often that's the most effective and most cost-effective way of doing work in the uh, mountain areas. And uh, uh, I think I also would really, uh, you know, uh, like to share the, the, the really good work that has been done in on Nepal on bioengineering uh, by WWF and, and, and others. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Sarod, uh, Sarod, just, Sarod just briefly reconnected and then seems to have dropped off again. There's, uh, uh, in the meantime, perhaps I could address another question, uh, which is uh, from Saifu, who asks, uh, what is microbial and chemical water contamination in water that has been harvested off roads? Yeah, this is a very important question. I'm happy it's being asked. Um, but basically, you use the road body, yeah? not the road surface. Yeah? You use the embankment on which the road is located to guide water. Yeah? So the volume of water that falls on the road surface and that is being used is, is very, very, very small. And, and that's already there anyhow. We don't want to harvest water from the road uh -huh. surface yeah? because uh, that's has a risk of contamination. Now we've also checked it yeah? in rural areas and low volume roads, definitely it's just not a huge issue uh, or it's no issue, but definitely if you go to high volume roads and you go to urban areas, um, we should, uh, you know, we should not use that water yeah? from the road surface for, you know, productive and definitely for consumptive uses. Um, Maybe for recharge, in some situations you can you can do it, and this is also being done in in, in concepts like Spawn City. So uh, there are definitely uh, so so it's definitely it's a really good question. But if you look at the total volume of roads uh, water, sorry, that we can harvest or that we can control yeah. with roads, the water from the road surface is you know less than less than you know a tenth of a percent basically. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I also continue with, with Saraj's presentation because I think I know some of it and uh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, Saroj is back with us, so I think uh, he, he can continue also. Uh, yes, so just in time Saroj has rejoined, so Saroj please continue. Okay, yeah, I think I missed some parts uh, between the time. So let me continue with the... We just took some questions and comments while you were away. That's it. Please just continue. Okay, thank you. So I was speaking, talking something about the terrain. So actually, the, in the flood management, we are talking about uh, uh, keep uh, enough space for the uh, rivers, and then uh, do not choke the river with the bridges. Because actually, in this picture, you also see uh, the, the river uh, embankment are so wide, but the uh, river uh, those bridges choke the water, and then water started flowing outside instead of flowing from the river. So uh, we think we see that uh, groundwater is a treasure and asset for the uh, Torai area. And controlling groundwater table with the uh, we can see uh, we can do that to 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 increase the groundwater in the Torai area. We can do some kind of measures like uh, uh, controlling groundwater table with the bridges, managing maintaining some level of water in the bridges with the bridge seals. And then, of course, we have been trying this in Tarai that uh, spreading of runoff with the bonds because we actually, while we are doing uh, agriculture, are, are doing uh, uh, plantation, we do a number of uh, bonding and then we plant within that. So uh, that is kind of measure we can uh, <coughs> increase, we can do to increase the groundwater in the areas. So in, in the figure, you can see <coughs> this is a road from, again, from Mahotari, the one in the uh, left bottom corner, you can see uh, uh, water collected at the side of the road. Actually, <coughs> the Department of Road uh, uh, extracted the uh, soil from the uh, road sites to, to do a maintenance of the road, and then they actually left it there, but that became an opportunity for people to uh, use the water during the dry period. Actually, it was taken in 2018 when uh, the uh, rainy season delayed, 
and then they started using uh, this opportunity to uh, irrigate their crop. And uh, in the top right corner, you will see uh, the series of uh, ponds where water is stored, and then the water from the root surface are also directly uh, go to the uh, pond storage. So uh, I tried to put some of the uh, lessons learned from uh, uh, green roof of water in the pond. We try to see that in terms of relevance and appropriateness of uh, ground water, uh, green road for water. <clears throat> so when we were talking with the people uh, in the road sector, they were saying that the, the foremost biggest uh, enemy of the road is the water. Uh, road is water. <clears throat> and in this scenario where a road in fact is bearing huge damages by uh, Water actually, Frank has also uh, uh, has shown some data of the how the damage occurred by water in this previous uh, uh, presentation. So uh, this can be a good, big opportunity because this will uh, increase the uh, long, increase the life expectancy of the road, while we can also use this road, uh, this water from road to our agricultural purposes. So they have a double benefit. And now we see what is the need of uh, green roof for water in our uh, context. Uh, because uh, the water distribution uh, is not uniform in our context, and uh, the interruption of the road further deteriorates the situation by changing water flow patterns. Actually, it's happening. If you uh, see in the area where road, road introduced, there is a lot of damage. Yeah, I'm really sorry, people. We seem to have uh, lost uh, Saroj again. Uh, in the meantime, Hillary, if you can hear me, I would like to ask you to please uh, uh, to please come online, connect, and uh, start your presentation because we also have to keep, uh, take into account the time that we have, and uh, we uh, we can address uh, the questions from Nepal, the topics from Nepal in the Q and A session. So, uh, Hillary, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I will just pull up your presentation. And uh, yes, please uh, take it away. I will unmute you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Abraham. I hope everyone is hearing me well now. Uh, I'm waiting for the presentation to load on my PC and then I can go ahead. Okay, uh, there it is. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to this webinar and I prepared something to share with you some of the things you're facing in Uganda and the opportunities you're seeing and what we have learned, for example, in the implementations we've been doing. Uh, when you look, if you look at this opening picture right here, you're going to realize some measures that are being used in some parts of Uganda where we've been. Uh, that is in uh, Luvanda district, where we found a community which is more knowledgeable about some of the measures we're teaching about, and they have their own way of implementing some of these measures. Uh, when when the road is uh, worked on by the district, for example, we found that the community was using stones aligned at the drainage sections, and then also live fencing to protect the roads from erosion and also the life facing they're using was also having other values that communities can use it for. For example, most of them were, uh, I saw aloe vera, a lot of it, and other natural herbs that can be used for medication. So, uh, what are the opportunities for green roads for water in Uganda? Uh, we have so far had a number of opportunities that we have tried to <coughs> identify and also try to, um, to, to and we have identified and these are some of them. One, uh, we have worked with the government uh, ministries and departments and agencies, various of them, at several occasions where we're trying to see that roads for water can be advocated for by the same ministries and agencies. 
and also in the same uh, way we have tried to find ways of raising funds to ensure that roads for water or green roads for water can be incorporated into programs or even in new programs that can be developed. Uh, you you might notice that the cost of implementing roads for water is not that uh, expensive compared to that of building the roads, for example. But also there was a challenge at some point when we wanted to integrate some of the techniques that we were sharing to these people in the ongoing projects. And there was following the budget of the letter that kind of hindered that. So one way was to come up with ways of how we can raise funds and get funds uh, targeting to implement roads for water activities. And, uh, right now we are working on a concept note with uh, a number of ministries, including uh, Works and Ministry of Water, that now we're almost finalizing to share <coughs> and apply for climate funds. Uh, we have also, on uh, another note, worked with the uh, international organizations, uh, including the International Fertilizer Development Center, and we have worked with them on number of, on the rich project in Uganda, where we have worked in about now three districts with them, uh, building capacity of communities and technical people at the districts on how they can implement roads for water on all the roads they are constructing in those areas. Also, we have done some work with the Danish Refugee Council in the Northern Uganda Resilience uh, Initiative project that's cutting across a number of districts, about eight of them in northern Uganda, and we trained them and gave them, the, shared with them the guidelines that they are using in the community access roads they are developing that side. So they are, they, what this shows that there are a number of opportunities and people appreciate the concept of green roads for water, and already this has been taken up even without, say, getting direct funding to do the same in Uganda. Uh, we have so far identified other opportunities that are soon coming up. Uh, I've been in talks with a, a gentleman from a Waterpreneur. Uh, they, they have uh, a program called the Innovate for Water Marketplace and we are trying to do, and this is to bring together a number of players in the water sector in one place where some can pitch and others can offer what they can do in terms of funding and financing uh, impactful projects. And in this platform, we hope that the Roads for Water, which is also one of the programs that's running also in Uganda now, can be uh, exposed to other financiers and funders that can also uh, ensure that we do some more work in this regard. Also, we have established con contacts with the uh, USAID, who are also our partners and our funders for the same program. And here in Uganda, we are trying to find out which opportunities exist to work with uh, Feed for the Future. Feed the Future program uh, through the through the USAID here in Uganda. Uh, yeah, there is also universal research geared towards having more data locally available to show the impact roads water can have. You've seen the presentation which Frank had with the figures and the the, the, the research that was done in Ethiopia. The factor four in one year of the benefits just an investment of 3,600 per 10 kilometers. So we're also trying to see that there is local data in Uganda that can support uh, the same and people get to understand more and more advocates should be there to have more roads water initiatives implemented and activities done on ground. Yes, another opportunity is that uh, Uganda has is a different kind of setting compared to Ethiopia and other places where the roads water initiative has been ongoing, but I should say that there are also opportunities that are open also in Uganda. For example, we don't have mass mobilizations that happens in Ethiopia, but also in Ugandan part, uh, if you go to Western Uganda, say Kanungu, you find that communities are used to working in groups, and most times they, they, they gather and they work on a project, a community project, they call it Burundi Wansi in the local language, where communities come up and they're mobilized by the local leaders and they work on a project. Uh, this is the intervention we used with IFDC when we're working in Kanungu, on the roads in Kanungu. So here we are working with the communities, they are providing the labor the, and we're just facilitating them with the tools and the knowledge and just guiding them on what to do in implementing some of these small interventions that were helping them address the issues that come with road water runoff and all that, 
runs water intends to address. Also, we have worked with women groups and youth groups, which also I saw Izit Saraju was talking about uh, that runs for water, which was normally intended for uh, roads and water, has also turned out to benefit um, or contribute to social empowerment of women and youth. The same is happening in the areas we have worked. Uh, we have observed that the youth who are, in most cases, unemployed, who are, who are working for a day's income, can learn this skill through the trainings we've been training them on how to manage water on the roads and to the gardens, and they have gone ahead to earn from farmer to farmer when they do the same service for them. So there are quite a number of opportunities, and these can be exhausted uh, in, in a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, okay, uh, the experiences we have had here in Uganda, for example, is that like I've mentioned, we don't have uh, mass mobilizations that happen somewhere else, but uh, there's an opportunity to work with farmer to farmer basis, where a farmer interested, or farmer groups, for example, we have worked in Mitiana with a farmer group. The farmers themselves organize themselves into a group, and they express their interest, so we just go there and give them the knowledge, and they do the implementation by themselves. The other way of also doing it, and that also facilitate, facilitates knowledge transfer, but also for the youth, for example, that we have been training and have been working as casual laborers or casual workers in that period of implementation, stay on with that skill and they know how to handle the water from the road, from the mitre drains and safely divert it to fields in a way that they don't damage but retain the moisture on the, on, the, on the farms. So it has, in one way, I remember in Kweni we worked with uh, about 30 youth and then when we went back to see the situation, we found these were charging a fee to some farmers to do the same work for them. Those that maybe were not the selected sites for the trials we did. And also, some of the benefits, many of the benefits have been mentioned by the presenters that came before me. But we, I must say that uh, roads where we have done such interventions have become more secure. You don't see a lot of road induced flooding. And then they're also more reliable can be used through even the rain seasons. As most of the interventions have been done in some areas, you see the improvement that is happening on the roads. The other issue is also, sometimes, uh, when I take an example of Kweni district in Uganda, we had a farmer called Masoba Moses. He had challenges with the water coming from the culvert and then washing out all the crops, the vegetable crops he was planting in his garden. So when we introduced these interventions to him and did some of the trenches and the ditches, I can say that the flooding that was happening in the fields stopped and then directed for proper use. Moisture content has been increased for him and is growing pasture along. Uh, it's only that I failed to see a picture for this. But also uh, in Agago, this has been used, lots of water has been used to facilitate the greening and growth of pastures. Uh, uh, Hilary, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just wanted to point out that we are a bit uh, pressed for time, uh, what with all these interruptions and everything. So I would really appreciate it if uh, you could uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, go through your slides a bit quickly. Uh, so we have uh, uh, we have enough time for uh, Q and A uh, and discussions. Uh, sorry again for the interruption. Uh, so, also, what we have learned from the field interventions, uh, Uganda has, uh, the Uganda's land tenure system is a bit complex and also insecure. We have found uh, in different locations, land is managed differently and is owned by different individuals, or sometimes by the government where the road is gazetted. But most of the feeder roads where we are working on, uh, where we are doing these interventions, the land is owned by individuals or by communities. So. Where land is owned by individuals, for example, in Kweni, we had to get uh, consent, uh, for example, by using acknowledgement forms, by having the farmer to uh, sign on a form which we develop with them to give us consent that they have accepted to first uh, put, say, the ditches on their farms. And uh, this could cause, uh, avoid future issues rising on who put the structures there and maybe anything that can come after that, since the land is owned by the farmers. 
And then also, uh, from the interventions, we've realized that more sensitization is needed by the, at the grassroots by the local farmers and the roadside farmers who are going to be affected by water from these roads and who are the be beneficiaries, the main beneficiaries of these interventions. So before we are doing a lot of sensitization with the technical people, but again, for people to own the interventions and to be part and to appreciate, to realize that more time is devoted. What we do now, we devote more time to the grassroots and the farmers themselves, the ones we uh, normally give more attention in training and giving such skills. Also, uh, deciding together with the communities what we can do. Uh, in my next slide, uh, as you can see, we have always engaged the communities in the training before we go to the field to implement. And also, uh, for example, in the case of Rubanda district, we found that the farmers or the roadside communities in these areas had better, had their own uh, technologies or interventions they had already done in the same regard. So we first engage them. We know what they have been doing before after explaining to them what we are doing. Sometimes you, you find that they have their own ways of say maintaining the road as you can see in the picture below where they have the stone bands running along the drainage line and then you have the to avoid erosion and then the life fencing they used specifically in this district we didn't find any life fencing which didn't have a secondary purpose it was planted for life fencing along the road and to maintain the uh, to avoid erosion and all that but also they were all medicinal so in this scenario, we had only to use the types of uh, life fencing the farmers wanted to use before, because they already attached another value to them. As if you can see down here uh, on the picture below, there's a lot of alvera also growing there, and other life fencing that can be used for medicinal purposes. Um, the next slide, you see some of the trenches and the casual workers that we used in the picture above, and some of the water collected after a rainy season. This picture was different. I didn't have the picture for before, because we did it before the rainy season starts, started. But uh, in this particular location, we were told the water from the road above was just washing through the garden and normally damaging all the plants that were there before. So following the drainage um, channel, we diverted all the water to the the trenches, which was now controlled and retained for moisture uh, increase in the, in the fields. The picture below shows uh, a water harvesting pond, very small ponds that this water is harvested, is harvested actually from a road. And this is what existing, is existing also in Rubanda, where, in Rubanda district, where farmers, a few farmers who can afford uh, dig small ditches and they encircle them with uh, live fencing to avoid evapotranspiration, evaporation, and then also get water from the road diverted to these ditches, which they call uh, Ebisizi in their local language. Now, in Rwanda alone, this water, which is from the road, these farmers who could afford to do such small ditches were selling a 20-liter jerry can at 1,000 to, to other farmers to feed their animals and all that during the dry season. So we are now working with IFDC and almost we are supposed to start implementation. However, due to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, the pandemic has kind of stalled the works that were supposed to be started that site. But the idea was to have more bigger community ponds that can supply water to the community to feed their animals and all of that for small scale irrigation and others. Uh, yeah. Some of the ongoing activities now in Uganda as I can say we are doing a lot of engagement with the private sector and uh, international NGOs and other uh, players in the sector to have roads water implemented, at, even on a small scale where funding can be secured from them. We're also finalizing on the concept note for the Green Climate Fund to get funding to have several ministries implement roads for water interventions uh, also, we have an ongoing program uh, with the Green Future Farming program, which is under the IKEA Foundation, and this is 
being carried out together with the Rain Foundation and Dig It, Just Dig It. And also we are planning, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, with Innovate for Water, a marketplace where we are going to be working as co-designers for the event to bring together all players in the water sector uh, with fin financiers, projects, uh, people who are doing projects and what they are doing exactly to pitch their projects and ministries and agencies to come in one place and see what ideas can be, uh, for example, funded, which projects can be funded and how we can increase the impacts of such projects. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for listening to me. I call back now. I now call back Abraham to take on take us through the next. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Hilary. Frank, could I ask you to come back on? We go from here to the Q and A part. Uh, we have been uh, we have been getting uh, questions throughout the uh, uh, the discussions throughout the presentations, and uh, we did find some time to address some of them uh, during uh, uh, some of uh, the interruptions, some of the technical interruptions. But we still have more, so let's get to them. Um, Okay, so the first question is from uh, Lori for Saroj. Uh, I will unmute Saroj's microphone. Who asks, how is this being paid for in Nepal? And I suppose uh, Lori is referring to like uh, this whole range of activities that Saroj spoke about. And just in time, uh, uh, Saroj has dropped off. So Frank, could you please uh, take this question? Frank, uh, we don't hear you, like at all. Do you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yeah, OK, good. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Two things on Nepal. Um, first of all, we are working with the um, uh, Department uh, of Local Infrastructure they've changed their role with the decentralization they're more like a guide to the local governments so that systematically uh, the uh, work on uh, the protection of springs are part of the road uh, construction secondly um, in nepal there has been a lot of work with road maintenance groups and road construction groups and these were basically it was a sort of mix between the road development program and also a program providing employment opportunities for people in the remote mountains areas and uh, again you know that was uh, very much following a more a green roads uh, concept mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the next question is from uh, uh, jasmina uh, who spent the last year in cambodia and uh, I'll try to speed read the question. Uh, uh, she found the roads to be in pretty bad shape. So if you would like to kickstart kick start such an initiative over there, where does one start? Does one approach the Ministry of Transport, the Ministry of Environment? Who are the major stakeholders in the countries where it has been rolled out? And can you recommend a certain approach for uh, starting things off? Also with regards to financing. Uh, how are interventions in Ethiopia, for example, being financed? Is it being picked up by the government? So I guess uh, the question basically is, how do we kick things off? Yes, yes. Yeah, first of all, uh, uh, Yasmina's question is also about areas with extremely high rainfall. Yeah. Uh, yes. So there the challenge is very much to retain water, uh, to prevent water logging, um, uh, to store water, because even in high rainfall areas, there's usually a, a, a dry period as well, and so you know the 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 with buffering water, yeah, uh, you could sort of uh, uh, kill two birds in one stone, uh, reducing the flooding and the the damage and the water logging, and at the same time uh, creating uh, more uh, storage. And road infrastructure has a large role to play. This is very much the sort of experience in, in Bangladesh, which I think with, with a lot of modifications would be relevant to Cambodia as well. Um, to kickstart it, we, we have kickstarted it. We've worked in, in different countries. So um, the main thing is to find the champions. Yeah? 
and to find champions uh, in um, with have a relatively large mandate. Yeah, uh, who, for instance, in in Uganda, uh, the work that Hillary has been using is is been doing is sort of watched very carefully by the Ministry for Water and Environment, and they have larger programs, and uh, the Ministry of Roads in Ethiopia. Uh, we were, I think, in, in general, there was a very fortunate situation where uh, you have large watershed campaigns. So in the uh, lean period, uh, many people are mobilized to basically do landscape restoration, landscape improvement, and roads for water measure became part of it. So relatively, that was easy to go to scale in Ethiopia. But for instance, in Kenya, I mean, I see also the weaker among the uh, uh, participants and Nancy. Um, there, you have to work with the counties. Uh, so every every I would say every country has its own sort of special, you know, map of you know movers and shakers. So you need to identify that, and then also you need to to find good individuals. In Bangladesh, we've benefited a lot. Uh, by working with Nuri Islam from the local government department. So you have these extraordinary individuals. The second part of it is to get it into guidelines, to get it into regular programs. And sometimes it's really helpful if uh, international organizations, uh, you know, uh, endorse it. Uh, we've benefited a lot from the context and the credentials from the International Roads Federation, who uh, gave us their uh, Global Road Achievement Award uh, a few years ago as being the best environmental practice. So that has opened a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Bangladesh. Actually, it is a two-part question. Uh, first of all, what are the opportunities to, opportunities to stop or reduce salinity ingress in coastal areas? Uh, also, what are the opportunities for road water harvesting in urban areas? Yeah, uh, you're very good questions. Um, I think in coastal areas uh, such as Bangladesh, you know, the ingression of, of uh, salinity can to some extent be controlled by creating a better managed fresh water buffer. Huh? And again, road infrastructure has a large role to play. Uh, if you, can, if you look at the poll. Okay, uh, Frank seems to have been disconnected in keeping with the theme of the day. Uh, so, in the meantime, I'll uh, find a question uh, for um, Hillary. Okay. Hello? Hi. Hello? Yeah, Frank, you're back. Please continue. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, in Bangladesh, you need to create a, a, a strong uh, uh, water buffers, fresh water buffers in these coastal areas to stop the uh, ingression of salinity. So the more fresh water during the monsoon you can retain, the better. So there are several things you can, what you can do in the polder areas. You can use the roads to store water behind the roads. If you build roads, you will create, um, you create storage ponds. Those, the excavation material from also from the drains. Yeah? Can be used to to construct roads. So I think there's a whole uh, you know uh, repertoire of measures to retain more fresh water in the coastal uh, areas to control the uh, ingression. And also one specific one which I've seen in China is sometimes you have these uh, what they call low cost ways. These uh, uh, there was a picture of it as well. But you have them in coastal areas where where you have a road crossing, not with a bridge, but just with uh, with concrete slabs and if you place them well they can be also be a barrier between fresh and saline uh, groundwater uh, yeah you no 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 it's a few further back but okay it was one of the first slides Abraham with pictures no 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 we're too far too far too far <laughs> it must be slide six or so. Yeah, no, next one. Next, next, next. Yeah, this one, you can see uh, 
this sort of low causeway, and it's the upper, uh, 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 upper lower left uh, picture. But you can also have them in coastal areas. Yeah, so it's a road crossing, and then you know it, it acts as a salinity barrier as well. If you make it sort of uh, based on the on the bedrock, yeah, and then you have fresh water on one side, and you have saline water on the other side. There's also one. Uh, uh, one particular uh, solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so uh, next up. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Areas. Yeah. yeah. In urban areas, we need to be a bit careful. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I think, for instance, there's this concept nowadays of sponge cities in, in very dry areas that we need to retain as much water as possible yeah, in, in arid areas around uh, 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 around small towns uh, and, and larger towns. And uh, I think particularly around small towns it's relatively easy because of the connection with the, you know, the, the, the surrounding uh, uh, landscape. So also there you can do things like um, like the uh, uh, sand dams and, and road crosses that we just saw. Um, uh, we can do a lot of water harvesting and, and increase the recharge around uh, uh, the towns. Uh, but to harvest water directly from the surface of the road, I would be careful. I think in general there's a lot, a lot, a lot to be done in connecting uh, you know, road drainage, water management, also in urban areas, because we see many cities uh, in the world when it rains, you know, we have, you know, we have major uh, flooding in the, in the cities, but it's often caused by the roads, because the roads don't have enough cross drainage, so the water blocks up, but if you would sort of also be able to, to lead it to areas where it can recharge, again, in cities, the uh, often the, 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 the pavement is impervious. Yeah? Now, in many countries, we, we are moving more to, 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 to impervious in pavement so that rainwater can also infiltrate, doesn't create floods, and it will recharge the groundwater uh, underneath the city. So there's, again, a whole range of uh, opportunities there as well. But you need to be, uh, it, it's much more sensitive, it's much more, uh, you know, complications, but also we, we need to be we need to take care that we don't pollute the groundwater, for instance. Yeah. I remember once being in, in Los Angeles, they paved, it's a, it's, a, it's a bizarre image, they paved the small dry rivers because they were afraid that the, uh, the, the pollution from the roads would, uh, would pollute the uh, groundwater. Okay, thanks, Frank. Uh, we get to the to a question for Hillary from Mark Ekiru, uh, who wants to know if there are some collaborations or partnerships with the government-led labor-intensive public works, and uh, if such projects also take place in northern Uganda, Karamoja in particular, where a lot of ponds are being done, were being done. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that question, uh, Mark. I, I, I must say that, uh, I don't know of any collaboration with the labor-intensive public works. However, we have worked with existing government systems, the Ministry of Works and the local government. Uh, they normally have uh, people that maintain the roads uh, through the labor-intensive approach. They call them road gangs. And these ones, we, train, we included them in the training, such that as they are doing their normal maintenances, uh, along these roads they consider uh, roads water interventions, green roads for water interventions. Yeah, but again, I would also be interested to, to link up with Mark and you see, uh, because what I know with the labor intensive public works, the intention is also to have many people in the villages contribute to the development of these roads and as a way create an earning for them. I want to see which opportunities are existing for, for roads for water in the northern part of the country. I know that the Northern Uganda uh, Road Resilience Initiative under the DRC was using the same approach in about nine districts in northern Uganda. So 
I, when I get, I think when I can, I want to get in touch with uh, Mark, and I get to know more about this, and you see what you can do again to advance the engagements. Thanks. Maybe Mark, at the end of, I can get Mark's email. I would want to ask him something more about this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, sorry, I just realized that perhaps you did not uh, hear the question from my side. Uh, thanks, Saroj, for sharing the Nepal experience. What are the potentials of reducing GLOF risks through these measures? Uh, thanks. So for the question, uh, yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, this has been also raised uh, uh, when we were uh, doing our workshop uh, in Nepal. Actually, uh, 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 I mean, uh, there are. I think there was there was a, there's no such what happened in case of Nepal like uh, with the globe. But I think something happened uh, in case of Tajikistan. Uh, where uh, uh, our colleague went to do a research in mountain area, and then I think one of the story they were saying is like uh, to to you know uh, transfer uh, water to, from the globe to certain area uh, somewhere far around two three kilometers and store it somewhere. Maybe uh, Frank can explain it a bit more about uh, uh, the globe uh, experience in Tajikistan. Uh, I have uh, a suggestion uh, for those of us who... Uh, shall I do it? Yeah. Uh, Glove is very spectacular. It's a sort of lake which is created because of a landslide. Yeah? And that landslide, you know, blocks the river. And then, you know, a, a sort of huge water storage is created uh, in these mountain areas because of these these landslides and they are very unstable and there's a lot of uh, worry that you know they would sort of uh, you know you collapse again and then you would uh, release a large uh, a large flood um, and uh, so we saw a lot of that in Tajikistan and um, I think in general I would say that the road itself you know it it, it cannot, you know, address this, but I think a better land management, yeah, better water storage in these, uh, uh, in these mountain areas, um, stabilization of the hill slopes, and roads are part of that, yeah, but there are several measures, yeah, uh, and, and what we saw in, in Tajikistan, actually very little was happening, very little was happening, land use planning, people would build, uh, you know, houses and develop agricultural land on the scree slopes. So there's a lot uh, of opportunities to uh, do better land management and water retention or snow melt retention in those uh, mountain areas as well. And then roads are one out of, you know, maybe 10 must do's. Okay, thank you. On to the next question. Um, I would like to put this to Frank from Rudolph. It is a stack of questions which does not fit the question uh, screen. Um, what spaces do participants of EFAR, WFP, and other agencies see to incorporate green roads for water guidelines into the environmental and social safeguards, such as EFAR SACAP? Which conditions, such as demonstrated proof of, of, of pilot green roads for water are required for such incorporation? Who would be champions of such incorporation? Does anyone have specific experience with green roads for water guidelines and green funds, uh, such as ZEF and GCF? Where in which countries could such experiences of green funds be visited in the field? 
Does anyone have experience with green roads for water and the use of uh, HIMO in uh, social investment funds or social network transfer funds? Uh, I guess this is a stack of questions on which we would love to hear uh, from uh, some of uh, uh, some of uh, the people working at such organizations. But uh, Frank, could you talk a bit about uh, your experience interacting with such organizations? As I know, we did. Uh, we have been doing this question to to type it in the uh, in the chat box uh, because it's a question which is probably addressed to everybody. And I think we have a lot of people who, um, who might have or might not have experience. Um, we have uh, we, are, we are working with the World Bank on the guidelines, and they're about to be published. And uh, I think that's one way of creating this sort of uh, lever. Yeah? And uh, and then the idea is also to take it further and uh, work with specific road building programs on the ground. To create these sort of local examples and and have it nested within the main organizations. Similar discussion with the Asian Development Bank, uh, where um, again we have two fantastic champions in the Asian Development Bank who are uh, trying to uh, move this uh, forward and make it a part of the safeguards or of these sort of standard practices in road building within the World Bank. In some new road building uh, projects, um, people have uh, reserved 5% yeah, of the construction costs for such measures. So I think these are ways forward, but um, I, there's so much more to be done. And I think what is being done is not so difficult. You can also do some, some very more complex things, but there's a lot of low, 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 low hanging fruit. Yeah? And uh, we are in touch with 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 uh, the World Food Program, with WWF, with IFAT, and yeah, we are hoping that uh, uh, this will also move a bit a uh, bit further. We are really open for it, and uh, uh, yeah, I think sometimes uh, it's 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 just waiting for the right opening, the right opportunity, and particularly doing it in some ongoing program so that people will see the uh, experience. But we have a lot of things to show in all the 10 countries where things are in progress. So uh, that's from my side. But uh, I think it's really an open an open question, and, and uh, that's part of the alliance building. Abraham, I, I didn't hear you, but I'm reading the question, so I hope you can hear me. <laughs> so yes, it's a really good point. Uh, that was also related to the other question uh, uh, for road water harvesting in cities. And I think it is a, a matter of rethinking road drainage, basically, in, in, in general, yeah? uh, but particularly also in uh, in urban areas. I, I think the point of Islam al haq is uh, very spot on. Okay, thank you. Um, well, actually, with that, uh, we seem to have reached uh, the end of the questions. And uh, we certainly have reached uh, the end of the time that we had a portion to uh, the webinar. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, we seem, yes, we have reached uh, the end of the questions. Uh, and uh, we are here all from different sectors and from different parts of the world. So we'll all have different takeaways from the discussions today. Uh, we as Meta Meta, as the Roads for Water Learning Alliance, Hope that part of your takeaway is an appreciation appreciation of the fact or recognition of the fact that uh, what this approach involves uh, is relatively simple technology, which 
uh, which most of us in the road construction sector, or the water management sector, or the agriculture sector know and are familiar with. What we are really talking about is good planning, which takes into account all these uh, different techniques and these different you know possibilities, and good implementation with uh, different sectors and organizations, NGOs, government organizations, engineering organizations working together and in a coordinated manner. Good coordinated implementation is really the last mile, and that's where either the magic happens or things fall apart uh, from our experience. So uh, I would like to conclude by thanking Frank Saroz and Hillary for your great questions, but especially to you, the audience, for turning up in a large number. Perhaps that is what crashed uh, the server of Adobe Connect, <laughs> and we had all these technical difficulties. So good job. Let's do that again. Um, We'd like to thank you also for your great questions and for your patience in general through some of the technical hiccups that uh, some of you uh, had to face. So thanks a lot. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Green Roads for Water website. Uh, also the presentation, we will try to upload all the presentations on uh, uh, this uh, uh, this website, uh, greenroadsforwater.org. Greenroads for Anastasia, could you please type out that link into the chat box? And also on the www.thewaterchannel.tv slash webinars. Uh, and when this uh, uh, webinar room closes, you will be directed automatically to those pages. And a recording of the webinar will also be available on our social media, on, a, uh, on uh, uh, the Water Channel Facebook page and the Water Channel uh, Twitter handle, etc. Thank so thanks a lot, and see you next week.